Thank you for auditing Professor Sky's record review, the always positive new music review show hosted by a French professor in a scary Indonesian monkey mask. I'm not actually going to record the video in this. It's Halloween time, and the last time I wore this mask on this channel, it was when I was reviewing the album There Existed an Addiction to Blood by Clipping. And well, I'm going to be reviewing Clipping again. Two years in a row, they recorded and released an album that is drenched in horror, that is legitimately scary, that is actually smart, and puts those things together. And in music, it's very rare to find music that is scary and smart at the same time. Like Halloween music that's good, that's like has some depth to it. I mean, of course, there's Monster Mash, right? <laughs> But basically, what do we have for Halloween music? We have Monster Mash, which is great, but goofy. We have Thriller, which is, I would argue, the worst Michael Jackson single. It's just not a very good, I mean, it's a great song, but by Michael Jackson's standard, not very good. And then not much else. On this channel, I reviewed the, the Kim Petras albums, which are very good. It was kind of like dancey, fun uh, Halloween music. But can music do what horror movies do? And I think what Clipping has managed to achieve with these two albums, uh, Visions of Bodies Being Burned is the name of the new one, the one I'm reviewing now, is do what horror movies can do well. Be scary, be meaningful, like not just goofy. And the thing is, is that a lot of, I mean, horrorcore has existed as a genre in hip hop for a long time, but I've never particularly liked it. I never particularly liked it because it felt too goofy to me, and mostly it felt too gross. It seems like the themes, the primary themes of horrorcore, like the number one theme is, ah, human life is worthless, and then the number two theme is, let's be gross. And in horrorcore, I think, when I hear it, what I usually hear is people who watch horror movies because they love the kills. They love seeing the bowels coming out of the stomach. They love rooting for the killer and thinking about the way that the blood's gonna go spurting and the eyeballs are gonna be falling out. And the sort of, the, the cavalier uh, attitude towards human life and this obsession with gore is not why I like horror movies. And I love horror movies. I don't mind those things. I still like Friday the 13th, one through eight. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's, that's not what brings me to watch those movies. So what Clipping did with this album and with the previous one is do something that is really new. It really is new. It's music, any music of any genre, rock, hip hop, whatever. It happens to be hip hop. It happens to be kind of this industrial, avant-garde, glitchy, industrial, noisy hip hop. Managed to make a real horror movie album. And it's great. I would say too that there's um, there's a sort of growing, um, a sort of growing movement happening now of uh, many different African American artists, a lot of different Black American artists, figuring out ways of effectively using the horror of the history of the Black American experience uh, and using the horror genre to express that. And I think that's been very powerfully shown in in TV and movies by Jordan Peele. Uh, and I think it's, it's a fascinating area to, like, to process that trauma and process that grief. Because one of the great functions of horror in all cultures, for all races, is a way to process grief and deal with it. And there's some of that on this album, although I wouldn't say that's the point. This is definitely not Get Out, the, the musical. Um, and nor is it Tales from the Hood, the musical which is another great, very interesting movie around the similar thematics, but they are there a little bit. I'm gonna talk more about movies uh, soon. I do wanna say that it's funny. Oh, by the way, did you notice I'm wearing a blue jumpsuit? Do you know why I'm wearing a blue jumpsuit? It's part of my Halloween costume. I'm gonna show you at the end of the video. It's not scary. Part of what I guess brings people to this music is that it's fronted by David Diggs. Now, when I reviewed David Diggs and when I reviewed Clipping last year, I, um, you should watch the video, by the way. I, I think it was good. The, the mask is back. It was a year ago. I've gotten better at this. Um, so I didn't know basically anything about David Diggs. When I first listened to it all the way through, I had no idea who he was. And then since then, you know, um, 
my daughter likes musical theater, so I discovered that he played Lafayette and he played uh, Thomas Jefferson, I would put it in that order, in Hamilton, and whatever you feel about Hamilton, I, I begrudgingly like Hamilton quite a bit. The contrarian in me wants to dislike it, but that would, I would just be hating, I enjoy it. Uh, he's so good in that. Like, he is spectacularly good in it. Now, maybe that's just because, you know, the actor who wrote the whole thing, who plays Hamilton, is just not a very, not particularly good at singing and dancing and acting, so everyone else around him looks better. I'm not quite sure. Um, but he is so good. Davy Diggs is so amazingly good in that. And then since then, you know, I, I kind of had to watch it a couple times because my daughter's super into it. And every time when he comes on, I get excited. And so it was funny because this last year, I'm like thinking of clipping while I'm watching this guy. And I'm realizing, you know, he's a pretty special artist. I mean, it's, it's really special when you can get somebody who's capable of delivering something to massive audiences and capable of doing it authentically. He's an authentic kind of pop star guy, but then also in his, in his or her you know, private life, capable of making works of great artistic meaning. And so I think, I mean, I think David Diggs gets a lot of credit and everyone's telling everyone how great he is. So I'm not the first person to say it, but I do think it, it should be said. Also, he's wonderful on Kimmy Schmidt. <laughs> That's a TV show that we watched together as well. But let me get back to the thematics of this album and the way that I conceive of it. So um, I listened to it yesterday a couple times um, and I was talking about it with my daughter and, she, and I talked to her about what horror movies were referenced and she kept on saying like, well, what about this movie? And what about that movie? And do they say this? And do they say that? And I was thinking about it, I was like, not really. Like there's like four or five horror movies which are either directly mentioned or indirectly mentioned that are like very, very far in the front. And I realized, you know, that could be kind of weak. That could be sort of like um, Nightmare on My Street by, uh, by DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Pence, kind of a deep cut off their first album. You know, it like, it could just, it could be sort of Tales in the Hoodie, kind of like, you know, hey, let's just talk about horror movies. But that's not what happens on this album. I call this horror movie sampling. So sampling is a great hip hop art, right? And the point of good sampling is to take somebody else's original work, cut out part of it, take a part of it and recontextualize it, change it to make it yours so that you have something new. That's what makes hip hop sampling amazing. That's why when it's done poorly, it's pretty painful. But when it's done well, it's divine right? It's an amazing thing to be able to do. David Diggs, I think, I think he must have written all the lyrics, but we'll just say Clipping. Clipping manages to treat horror movies and basically sample them. Sample their ideas, sample their feelings, their sort of the atmosphere and emotion, and he sort of takes them, and he doesn't like, like, I'm going to talk a lot about a song about Candyman. He doesn't say Candyman. He never says the name, but he's able to take the thematics and just recontextualize it, put it in a, some kind of a larger context, often a larger context of social injustice or racial injustice, or even just a different kind of spooky, and he's able to make something new out of it. They're able to make something new out of it. It's really quite impressive what they're able to do, and it makes it such a great Halloween album. I mean, this is just, I mean, it's also a good Halloween album because it's just scary. Just clipping, uh, the production on here is very good very deep, very rich, very atmospheric. It's like, like, you know, there's like weird discs that they play, you know, like for Halloween, if you want to have like a good house, like you have like the sound discs with all like the ha and the sound of creaky floorboards and all that. Um, that's kind of scary, but this album, you could just put on in the background and it would do that function, but better just because the sounds are so ominous. There's a little bit of like sound effects, but for the most part, it's just the production. It's just like ringing like feedback and draining drills, it's just everything about it. But at no point did I ever feel that feeling that I get from horrorcore, you know, like the blood and the viscera. It's sort of a, it's sort of an A24 horror movie, uh, I guess you could say. So let's, let's go through track by track. It starts off with an intro. You wanna talk about a haunted house song. Um, it's just like, it's all sound effects and just sounds like scratching and thumping and feet coming closer and closer. And I was a little bit turned off in the beginning and then David Diggs starts rapping 
and it sounds like he's rapping into a can. Quite often, they will sacrifice um, like audio integrity for some kind of effect or atmosphere. Like he's, it really, it sounds like he's rapping into a soup can. Um, the thing about him is he does this, um, uh, he's so capable, he's very, like if you've mastered something, right, you can do it very quickly and very slowly, but you can vary the speed at your own will, okay? Um, so he's able to like rap very quickly and very slowly and every time, every syllable, he never swallows a single syllable ever. Every single word is, not to be cheesy, but like a knife. Like his voice is very distinctive, right? I mean, when he talks, when he's acting in Kimmy Schmidt or when he's singing in Hamilton or when he's rapping and clipping, like this guy's voice is extremely, extremely distinctive and every syllable he hits. And he's able to use this variance of speed all the way throughout the album to create tension and to actually add to the fear because it's sort of like in a horror movie when you know some, you know, the bad guy's running behind you and he's trying to catch up or like there's just this sort of this anticipation and it plays with you. It kind of teases you because you never quite know how fast he's going to be going. Now that's very technical. I'm not always a fan of technical rap. He's not my favorite rapper. This isn't my favorite style of rapping, but I would say that it's using rapping as a kind of another instrument in this whole tableau that they're trying to create on this kind of horror movie. Then we get to my stamp, my favorite song on the album, and I would like to personally thank the band Clipping because of the following experience. Um, so I, I talked about this. Well, actually, well, yes. Let's, let me talk about this. So I, I was talking about this song with my daughter, okay? And I said to her, oh yeah, you know, because it starts off with this Ghetto boy sample, which is very cool. I guess it's him saying it. Uh, Candles in the dark, visions of bodies being burned. And you know, I, I know that song, my mind's playing tricks on me. And so immediately like I hear this sample and I go, okay, Ghetto Boys, they're kind of one of the first kind of horrorcore adjacent bands. I'm like, okay, I kind of get where this is going. you know, And I think I know what the song's all about. And it's just this amazing quote. I'm gonna play it for you in a little bit. This amazing sample, because it's a perfectly scary line. It's a little bit weird. Candles in the dark, visions of being burned. But then I discovered that the song is actually about the movie Candyman. And my daughter loves horror movies and we're like, I'm sort of trying to teach her about horror movies and what's good and what's bad, you know? And so I go, yeah, yeah, it's uh, about a movie called Candyman. And she said, and I'm not joking, oh, is that that scary movie about Willy Wonka? <laughs> and and uh, right then I realized, is there a scary movie about Willy Wonka? And if not, there should be, because Willy Wonka is inherently scary. But I said, no, no, I can't believe you don't know it. Let's watch it. So I rented it off of Amazon and I watched it. I remember seeing Candyman when I was like 16 years old. I don't know. I remember being good. Have you seen Candyman? This movie is so good. And it's not just like good for a horror movie. It's a solid, solid movie. The, the, the way it's filmed is outstanding. The music is by Philip Glass, like the avant-garde film composer. The movie starts off with this kind of weird homage to the, to the sort of tone poem uh, of a movie called Koya Nascazzi, and it's got this like long overhead with Philip Glass music, and actually feels like it's almost a, a, a spiritual sequel to a quasi-documentary with no words, Koya Nascazzi. I mean, you know, you want to talk about like the thematics of uh, American greed and America in the 80s and racial divisions and the different standards for white people and black people in America and the, how the trauma in the American inner city is ignored by white America up until it affects white America itself. Like the way it's acted, it's really scary. It's an amazing movie. And I wouldn't have watched it if it weren't for this song because this song is able to take a lot of those things and bring them out. It's able to make it clear that Candyman, who, if you don't know the story, was a son of a slave who was killed for being in love with a white woman and, and have, uh, having a baby with her, like, you know, he was killed brutally and then he goes back and he kills people, the bad guy. But just sort of like taking this character and turning him not quite into a hero, but sort of validating it. Sort of like, say my name or say the name is what it says over and over again. And in a way, it's sort of, it reminded me of Sympathy for the Devil, right? Because Mick Jagger never says, the name of the devil, the whole thing is, nice to meet you, won't you guess my name? Uh, I feel like this is kind of that. It's like sympathy for the candy man. And it kind of goes through 
the whole movie. Uh, each verse relates to it, but doesn't. Each verse works for it, but doesn't. Like the second verse is all about the woman who falls in love with him, but it's about like a college girl who lives too fast and like falls in love with a black guy. But it's sort of like in modern day, not really in the past. Like it seems to be more about modern questions of interracial relationships and racism in America, less than it is about now. And the whole time, I'm, I'm gonna play it for you now. The whole time the music is just so scary and just so effective and the sample that goes on over and over again candles in the dark, dark of bodies being burned and his voice just every single syllable coming in um okay i'll play it a little bit here the hook gonna be what it is the hands off the retribution for what you took from the man got blood on the rust god bless the red earth the dead man walks the tongue bridge a bridge the time space the boot the concrete the project undone you see, it keeps going, keeps building, the drums come in, it builds up. Seriously, if you don't listen to this song, you are going to have a bad Halloween. Well, COVID is making sure you have a bad Halloween. You're gonna have a worse Halloween. Seriously, you have to listen to it. It just cuts through. I think maybe too, there's a chance, there's a way to read the movie Candyman as an allegory about the crack epidemic. This might be evident. I haven't actually ever studied Candyman, I really should. But it feels to me that the last verse of the song hints at that fact. It talks about crack, it talks about zombie junkies kind of walking around. But it's just, it's all the way throughout. Whenever this album brings up horror movies, it feels like you can't quite put your finger on exactly what he's saying. And that's what makes it so great. It's not quite, it's not like I was saying to my daughter. It, this isn't like tic tac, like this is that and that is this. It's an atmosphere. It's sampling the feeling of Candyman. The feeling you get watching Candyman is the feeling you get listening to this. Damn it, this is really good. I really enjoy it. And I'm not gonna be able to get this piece of hair off my forehead, so I'm just gonna let it there. So if it bothers you, <laughs> I'll put the mask back on. Uh, it then moves on to Witchboard, which is like a goofy song with people on a, not even a song, it's an interlude with people at a Ouija. And then that leads into 96 Nev Campbell. More horror noise. Uh, this is a fascinating song because, you know, taking Nev Campbell, so it's obviously a reference to Scream, and again, this is very much about Scream. It's in the Scream universe, but it's also about the concept of the final girl in a horror movie and how she always wins and always, you know, defeats the bad person. But in this, it's like sort of taking it from like a potential victim to being almost like a hunter, like the final girl is like in charge of the whole thing. And just the line that keeps on being repeated, you're going to die about it. It's just a beautiful line. And it's kind of fun, but never funny, right? It's fun, but not funny. Which I think is how I think a good, uh, good upbeat horror movies can be. Um, there is a direct reference to Scream at one point. Do you, like, uh, do you like scary movies? They quote it. But I think it has these two female rappers on here. And I think that really emphasizes the theme that this I'm gonna sound like a grad student, but it's okay. I'm, I am a professor, I am a real professor. I'm not French, by the way, I'm a professor of French. Some people don't get that, but I wouldn't speak English this well if I were French. Um, so like, it is sort of about the agency of the female uh, hero, heroines in horror movies. Like here, it's just like, Nev Campbell's a badass and she's gonna get you, and you think that you're in control, but she is. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, maybe once per song, I'm gonna try to get the hair up. No, it's just gone, nothing I can do. The next track is called Something's Underneath. Uh, this is a great example of the variations of speed and time and repetition he's able to use. The whole thing starts off with him saying, rise about the dirt, which is just a fun thing to hear. Just, I'm gonna be doing some gardening at my dad's house later today. We're putting in some bulbs so he can look forward to something at the end of the COVID winter. Um, and you know, I'm just gonna like, the whole time, whenever I visit my dad, I'm just gonna look at the tulip, you know, the places where we put the irises, actually. The places where we put the irises and just go, raise up out the dirt. Um, this seems to be about cannibals or zombies, maybe, but it's got this great repetition of like this down, down, down. You're gonna drown, drown, drown. But just, this is the best example of what David Diggs can do. It's, because what he does is so technically flashy, it's sort of, it can be easy to be distanced from it and just kind of think of it like, all right, man, you can, but should you? 
this is a good example of how you should use this talent because it's just this rhythm that he's able to create and play with. It's just great. It's very poetic and very unsettling. And also, I don't like people just saying that rap is poetry. I think that diminishes rap and it diminishes poetry at the same time. Uh, I think they're two separate things that can be the same but are inherently the same. But this album is very, is, is very poetic, like in, in its approach, in the way that it's written, um, in its sort of usage of symbolism and its sort of ineffable quality. I would put it closer to the sort of poetic register than a sort of straight hip hop register. Um, he does, he did remind me of Outkast several times on this, and just his sort of general style reminds me a lot of Outkast. And then he does quote them on here what's colder than cold, ice cold. Uh, the next track is called Make Them Dead. I can't listen to it. I'm just, I'm sorry. It's just too unpleasant. There's just this like ringing, distorted, <laughs> just sound. I think it might be about vampires. I don't know. <laughs> it's not bad. It's good. I mean, I listened to it once, and then when I listen to the album subsequent times, like I just have to skip it. But I like that. I like this, this, uh, this dedication to noise rap, this dedication to being unsettling. Um, um, there, there's like one of my favorite things that, that I like to say, which is, uh, it's good, I don't like it. It's good, I don't like it. Uh, the next track, She Bad, is this cool kind of like southern gothic feeling. There's a lot of like different sort of genres of horror that they're somehow able to get to. The sound stays the same, but the things that are being described are slightly different. It seems like it's about a witch, maybe. Interesting like usage of like weird words, like blousy. He keeps on talking about someone named blousy which has like a cool, there must be a reference that I'm missing. Uh, it's a good track. Next one is Pain Every Day. And this is really hammering home that concept I was talking about before, about horror movie being, a, a, horror as a way of processing collective trauma, right? So the collective trauma of lynching obviously still exists, is very present in the whole country. We are all victims of the trauma, um, but obviously some of us are victims of of our ancestors causing the trauma, like me. But it's more about the, this whole song is about this like, the spirits of the lynched coming back to get the descendants of the people who lynched them. So in this way, it's cool and interesting because it's not just like Candyman where it's like the one person who was the victim. It's actually about the descendants, which makes it a little bit scarier. And I think actually makes it a little bit like a Freddy Krueger movie. It's like the, the, the children will pay for the sins of the parents, right? So like I would be hunted down by the spirits, right? That's scary, that's efficient. It has lots of cool like glitchy breakdowns, like jungle, like at the end has this whole, the end has this wild thing and I don't know, if somebody knows about glitching and, and the people who are producing it, let me know. I swear to God, if you listen to the end, they have these chopped up beats and these strings that I think are intentionally evoking the work of American composer Aaron Copland. Just, could you tell me if I'm right? Because it, like, maybe it's just like the, 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 the way it sounds or the tonalities that they choose. And that feels very intentional to me because Aaron Copland is the kind of the music of the West and like American optimism. And if you've ever kind of heard sort of hokey American classical music, that's what it's trying to go for. And it would make sense to have that over this glitchy rap, like this sort of like the glitchy rap representing the spirits that are killing the people who are just pretending that America is all just amber waves of grain and not bloodstained leaves, right? I don't know if that's on purpose, but that's what I heard. Another thing supporting my Freddy Krueger theme is he talks about grabbing people in their dreams or grabbing them in their sleep. So I don't know. This is sort of like a, if Freddy Krueger were a lynched person, which is pretty scary. Um, Check the Lock is, this is very much, this is what reminds me the most of Tales from the Hood. Uh, I don't know, Tales from the Hood, by the way, was like a, a 90s hip hop horror movie. It was very good, kind of a cult, cult classic, like little tiny vignettes. I think there was actually a story like this about like a super cool gangster, very powerful gangster who's afraid and haunted. And this is a great song because it, it drives home what horror movies are, what haunting stories are about uh, a lot of times, which is about the fear that lives within you, the guilt that you feel. It's this whole, this whole time, over and over again, just keeps saying like, we know that you run the city, but every time you walk by, you lock the door. 
Like he checks the lock. He checks the lock constantly because it just feels like all these ghosts are coming after him. It's about the paranoia of success. It's really nice. The next track is called Eaten Alive, another direct horror movie reference. This is the most direct because Tobe Hooper, to Toby Hooper? I'm not gonna say Toby because that's the name of my dog. He's gonna think I'm talking to him. Tobe, Tobe Hooper, uh, who made Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Poltergeist, made this bizarre movie that takes place in the Louisiana swamp, I believe it's Louisiana, about like this alligator that eats people at a hotel. It's a very dark, unsettling, great kind of schlocky horror movie. And this whole s song is about that kind of, but it's kind of sampling that atmosphere. And it's about like, I to see, do you hear the, the clicking in the back? That's Toby. It's all about like, when do they turn this swamp into real estate? And it seems like it might be sort of about gentrification or it might be even more about like, Tr the the problem of how the um, like gangster rappers have sort of like taken over hip hop and made it about money as opposed to having it be about sort of the struggle of daily life. I don't quite know. But then also mixed in is the guitar player from the band Tortoise, which is very bizarre. An instrumental, uh, experimental rock band out of Chicago that uh, I once saw play at TT the Bears in Boston, which is a very small club. It's a very good show. Uh, Body for the Pile. Um, I can't listen to this one either. It's just sort of about like three dead police officers in three different ways. But it's this is a little bit too much horrorcore for me, a little bit too much kind of a flippant take on human life. Uh, Looking Like Meat has this unbelievably unsettling uh, computer sound, vaguely cannibalistic. Uh, all, I think this is about Silence of the Lambs, but it's about the sort of the masks that we wear. Not those masks, but these masks, like looking, like wearing your face. I mean, it says like wearing your face, it's like wearing your face, the person I'm talking to, but also like I'm wearing my face. Um, this features someone named HO9909, who apparently is one of the founders of noisy hip hop. I don't know that, I'm not that cool, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take Genius's uh, annotations seriously for that. Um, so really nice lyrics. I'm just gonna read you a couple of lyrics here towards the end. Crip, keeper, crip, walking where the feet are lit, blood drinker, blood, talking when you see the blick, brazy on the brain, crack the skull, go on, eat the shit. So like, this feels like that scene at the end of Hannibal, I think it was, the second Silence of the Lambs movie. Um, where you have like people eating the brains of somebody, but then it's also crack of the skulls, also about crack, and it's also about like selling drugs, you know, the, the drug trade and gang warfare. And this is the thing, like this album does actually require a full graduate study approach. Like you need to sit down with this album and say what precisely are Clipping saying about African-American uh, uh, inner city, American injustice, the nature of crime, the nature of horror and trauma, because it's all in here, but it's very, very dense, and it's very, very well packed. My theory that this song is exclusively about Silence of the Lambs is emphasized by the fact the next track is just a bunch of lambs, a bunch of sheep making sounds, uh, and then we get to the track, and lacing, which I think is the most interesting production on the album, because it, it has an actual sample, this very distant soul sample that comes in and out as the song goes, this weird kind of vocals, and the, the song seems to be about sort of doing drugs and being out of it, but it's also about the point in a horror movie where you realize how bad things are. So it's sort of like the realization that doing drugs is bad, mixed together with the point in the horror movie where you go, wait a minute, there are ghosts in this house. Wait a minute, the zombies are jumping up out of the, out of the earth. Um, so the whole idea is like, get your ass to the floor. That's what it keeps saying, get your ass down to the floor. And it seems to be that like, that's about like, coming down to earth and realizing what's happening. It sounds like it's a traditional kind of club banger, hip hop song about, you know, strippers getting low, but I don't think that's what it is. Uh, I'm just gonna read you some of these lyrics just because I enjoy it. Um, I think it shows Anyways, I'm not gonna be able to do it the way he does it. Pick, pick up the pieces, pick up the cues like a human, which I think is interesting. Kind of like inside the mind of a killer, maybe. Like you have to pretend to be human, or when you're high, you have to pretend to be human. See what you needed, fuck are you doing, riding around euphoria with hammers out the window. Whistle, crip, and crack a rainbow, make it rain dance for your people. Put a pound of dro up in the pill and crush it down to powder. Let it sit under the tongue, check back in about an hour. 
It's that lover, love, and lost. It's that lost, that love, and feeling. It's that bass jump from the window while you're dancing on the ceiling. So if you even just look at the way the lyrics are written out, we have these long lines and short lines and variants in between. Very precisely done, very well done. It's that whoop get uh, geeked up. It's that sky, it's deeper than the pool that you swim in. You inside your speaker, it's your song, sling a tightrope walk, the skin inside your teeth, call that floss, bleeding diamonds, fine if you could only reach. One's up in the sky is smiling, they're so fine and they so far and you so small and you find out that you've been wishing on a star. Do you feel that? So it's this terrible recreation of getting high and going down and feeling outside of yourself, all mixed in with horror thematics, all produced amazingly, and at times the vocals just drop out and it's just him and then he'll double the vocals with lower vocals underneath to create a kind of unsettling chorus and then other things come back in and just builds up and it's just awesome. The whole album ends with just another kind of soundscape that's a little bit spooky. I don't think there's any rapping on there. It was hard to listen to, so I, I kind of skipped through it. It's called Secret Peace, so maybe I'm missing something secret. So there's my review of the album. It's extremely enjoyable. It is uh, very scary and very well done. Put together, these two albums, I think maybe represent the best Halloween music ever made, although there isn't that much out there. I think there should be more. Do you want to see my Halloween costume now? Maybe you guessed it. Um, do you, I'm not like a pill. I'm, a, I'm one of those guys from uh, Among Us, that video game that my kids like. So it's pretty good. My wife made the costume. It's really difficult. So there you go. Well, for the monkey mask, uh, for the crewmates and the imposters, there's the camera. I can't turn it off though because I don't have arms. I don't. I'm just gonna.